know, somebody um, uh, threw a pearl in, um, in our men's group conversation uh, saying pastor's predictions may have gone wrong, <laughs> but the predictions of Jesus are always true, <laughs> which is actually true. <laughs> my, my predictions come out of my wish for India to win, but the predictions of Jesus are always based on the truth. And so it's okay we lost. Uh, but yes, I am disappointed. Uh, would you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24? Before we do that, there are a couple of things that I do want to uh, take a moment to encourage you. Can I have the um, shoe box here? Uh, we have a couple of more shoe boxes left. I think we have about 50 or 60 still left. Can I? Can um, so I'd like to encourage you. This is the last week. You can pick them up. And from next week onwards, you start bringing them back here. Uh, into the church and start dropping off at the church right after the service. Um, we encourage you to do this. This this brings a lot of joy to people that we support to, the kids that we support, um, at the orphanages to which we are sending. This, in fact, this year we are uh, we are tying up with few, actually one orphanage to go there and do an outreach program. We are actually going to do another outreach program. I think it's, um, 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 Ashwant is supposed to announce that, but I'm just going ahead and doing it for you, Ashwin. Uh, we're also going to do a community outreach in a hospice where, um, you know, patients with palate, you know, who are on palatal care, um, we're going to go there and just spend some time, uh, you know, spreading the Christmas joy. So we'd like to encourage you, this, this Christmas is going to be not just our church programs, but there are a lot of other things that we are doing in order to do a community outreach and uh, see what we can do to the community as we spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So, I do encourage you to um, pick up the rest of the boxes that we have today. If you've already done that, pick more and do more. Uh, fill in more and bring them back so we can give it away um, as much as we can this, this Christmas. All right? Uh, don't forget to do that. Uh, we also have the instructions on what to put inside, what not to. Don't put chocolates and anything eatable, don't put it inside. Other than that, you can, you can give away gifts like uh, the kids that... Uh, you know, things that kids can use um, in their daily usage, books to read, and things like that. All right, so that's, that's something that I want you to remember. There's another thing that is happening today, right after the service. Now, I have the same butterflies running in my stomach just as um, uh, they ran 16 years ago when we started our church. Uh, like, when we planted the church, I had no idea how to pass the church. I've been a pastor's child, but never served under anybody. Um, I never had prior experience of pastoring a church. I didn't know how to handle people. Still don't know how to handle people. But just, you know, at that time, it was even worse. And I had a really tough time on how do we, how do I actually pastor? How do, how do we plant a church? Who brings people into the church? I had no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest. I still don't know that. Uh, but then uh, I've seen how God, if we just, pay attention to the leading of the Holy Spirit and just simply follow him, how God would just that use that uh, and, uh, you know, to bring about what he has in his heart. And I've been wrestling this, I, with this idea of starting a Hindi fellowship in our church uh, for like, for, yeah, come on. Uh, for, I still have butterflies. They don't go away, okay, because I still don't know how to preach in Hindi. Uh, <laughs> What I did manage to do is write my notes for this afternoon in Hindi. So my Jawahar Navadhyaya Vidyalaya helped me to learn some Hindi, uh, but that's all I know. Uh, so I'm b we've been praying about this. I, we didn't know how to, how to start a Hindi service. Um, would I be able to even share a word in Hindi? I don't know, but we're going to do that starting this afternoon at 12.30. Now get excited. All right, so we'd, we'd like for you to invite anyone who wants to join us here. We feel there is a real need for a Hindi-speaking service um, in, in this area, especially in this part of our, our city. And uh, it, it's been brooding in our hearts for so long, and I was always looking for somebody to come and say, can I do it? And I, at, at some point in the last six months, I realized nobody's going to come. You just have to do it. <laughs> You know, if God puts that in your heart, you just have to pick up, pick up the responsibility and keep doing it. 
and um, see where God leads us. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, starting this afternoon, um, we, we'd like to ask you to invite others, uh, people that you know of. You, uh, you don't have to join, but you can invite others. But if you want to join, you can still join and see um, what, how they you know, worship in Hindi and uh, see where God takes us in this journey too. You remember two weeks back, I told you we got to become rabbits, not, have, not, not stay elephants anymore. Um, I think we just got to start doing things um, and just follow the nudging of the Holy Spirit. Um, even if it's mean, it's small. We, we just need to keep growing. The end times are near, so the faster we grow, the faster we plant churches, the, the more people we reach out with whatever tools we have in our hand, um, we would be on the mission with Jesus by doing that. So um, that's what's going to happen this afternoon. So I want to praise God for that. This morning, as we turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, we have been studying what Jesus is talking about regarding what's going on in the world that is around us. Tim Lahe, um, Al Hai, um, wrote a book called Left Behind. Years ago, like almost 20, 25 years ago, a fantastic book called Left Behind, talking about how the whole end time looks like as he you know, explored the scripture along with other scholars. Um, and he makes this statement while he talks about end times. He says that we have, we have more reason to believe that Christ could come in our generation than any other generation which has ever lived. Because of the signs that are so visible and so clear around us, there is a high possibility that Christ may come in our generation. With that in mind, keep that in your mind. We turn to Matthew chapter 24 and listen to what Jesus is talking about. We've been looking at those verses for the last two weeks. We'll go back to those verses again. Today, focus on one particular aspect um, of um, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Chapter 24, verses 15 to 25. The day is coming when we will see what, the Daniel, what Daniel the prophet spoke about. The sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to hills. A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it would be. It will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on, on the Sabbath. But there will be greater anguish than any time since the world began. And it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive. But it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen one. Chosen, one, uh, cho uh, chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, look here, here is the Messiah, and there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. So, see, I have warned you about this ahead of time. Jesus is uh, very clear why he's teaching all this to his disciples. He's trying to say, listen, I'm warning you beforehand by giving you a hint at how the end times would look like. For the last couple of weeks, we looked at the signs that Jesus um, uh, uh, gave about the end times. Six signs we looked at in the first week. Six signs of the end days. How there would be a great spiritual Deception that happens around the world. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, the six signs of uh, second coming. We looked at how uh, there would be a constant international conflict. We looked at how, um, you know, the frequency between disasters, natural disasters, calamities and pandemics would continue to increase instead of decreasing. Uh, one after the other, things would keep hitting the world. Uh, we talked about how a uh, church in turn will face fierce persecution across the globe. Uh, people would continue to face more and more persecution. Um, and because of the persecution, 
there would be a widespread apostasy. Jesus talked about how many of uh, professing Christians would give up their faith simply because they can't take the persecution anymore. They would choose to walk away from their faith, not only do that, but in fact cause uh, other Christians also to be persecuted by giving up on them, by betraying them, by hating them. And yet, in spite of all those um, um, you know, calamities and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, things that, that, that are bringing suffering and pain. Jesus talked about how there is still a hope because there would be a worldwide evangelism. The church would continue to grow. The kingdom of God would continue to grow. There will be faithful people who would give up their lives in order to talk about Jesus to the world boldly. And so Jesus challenges us to be one of those that we should not give up on our faith. And that we should continue um, to stand firm because the one who stands until the end will be saved. That's what Jesus talked about. Then as we looked at the entire chapter 24, the following week, that is last week, uh, I kind of tried to rearrange how the end times would look like, the entire sequence of the second coming. For those of you who missed out, I just want to use that as a by, by the way of introduction for you. Say, uh, this, how does the end time look like? We as a church, there are multiple opinions about the second coming of Jesus Christ, how this whole event would take place. Uh, but as a church, we are what we call, we uh, call ourselves pre-tribulationists. That means we believe that the rapture would take place. Can you go to the next one? That the rapture would take place before tribulation starts. That's why we are called pre-tribulation. Um, most of the church are pre-millennials, meaning much of the church across the globe, irrespective of the denomination, they believe that Jesus would come back and reign on the earth for a thousand years. Majority of the church believes that Jesus would establish his kingdom, a physical kingdom here on earth, uh, along with believers and unbelievers who have been left behind and those who are on the earth at that point of time. And Jesus would uh, show what they missed as he rules here for a thousand years. Uh, that is called millennial, millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We as a church believe that Jesus would literally rule here on earth for a thousand years before he destroys Satan and uh, his uh, followers and those who chose to reject Jesus, all of them and condemns them to eternal death in hell before he does that. That's why... Um, because we believe these things will happen before the millennium, we, call, we are called pre-millennials. But some church, churches may disagree on when these two events would take place, rapture and tribulation. Some church, churches believe that the rapture would take place, that is the taking of the church into the heaven, um, that you know, the, all the saints of God who died in Jesus, all the saints of God who are living on the earth would be taken up um, as, you know, First Thessalonians, Paul talks about how when Jesus comes, we, are all, we will all be gathered in heaven. Um, that, would that is called rapture. That would take place, some churches believe, post-tribulation. That means after seven years of suffering under the rule of Antichrist, some of the church would be taken up, or the, the church would be taken up to heaven. And then Jesus would come back here to this earth. Um, we, and I, I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that I would go first. That before the tribulation starts, the rapture would take place. Because Paul kind of gives us a great hint at we being taken up, the f a church being taken up. Revelation hints at church being spared the suffering, the great suffering under the beast. Uh, so therefore, we believe that we'd be taken up before the tribulation happens, and then Antichrist will reveal himself and begin to bring great tribulation on the face of this earth for those who are left behind and on Jews who are on the earth, um, causing the whole world to go against um, these people and uh, Christians. Well, Jesus talks about how, in this passage that we have just read, how Antichrist reveals himself. And so I want to while I, in, a, in, a, in the sequence, I want to talk about rapture first, but I've decided before I talk about rapture, well, let's talk about Antichrist himself because uh, it's necessary uh, 
uh, you will understand as I speak, you'll, it's necessary for us to understand who this guy is and what he does before we can talk about rapture itself. Is it okay? So today, I want to talk about the spirit of Antichrist. What Jesus is talking about, hinting at, as, as to the actions of the Antichrist while he's on, you know, after he gets revealed, um, he, uh, the first thing that he does is he desecrates, desecrates the holy place, the temple of God, by removing uh, everything from the temple and erecting his own statue there and demanding that people would start worshipping him. Uh, that's why Jesus talks about the prophecy that came out of Daniel and uses that as the hint at how Antichrist would be um, uh, behaving. This uh, man of lawlessness, Thessalonians, in Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, calls him man of lawlessness uh, as he refers uh, to Antichrist in the, of the last days, will set himself up in the temple, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 uh, of 2 Thessalonians will set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem and will claim to be God and will demand the entire world to worship him. Those who worship him will be given the mark of beast on their hand and on their forehead. These are what Bible talks about, by the way. Okay, um, The mark of beast, which is uh, triple six as we call it, would be given on, uh, put on them. And those who refuse the mark of beast will be persecuted and many will be put to death. Jesus talks about how when those who refuse to take this mark would then be persecuted. And then he goes on to talk about how dangerous those times would be. He says, then let those who are in Judea flee Jerusalem. Flee their homes. Don't take up anything uh, with you. Just keep running. The, the command that Jesus is giving at that point of time is not to stand. He's actually asking us to run. Run, hide yourself. So that you would not be caught, up, caught, up, uh, uh, caught by this um, uh, antichrist and be persecuted and, uh, and suffer under his hand. Because the suffering that comes, the distress that comes when antichrist uh, you know, desecrates the holy temple is far worse than any other trouble that you have ever, uh, in the world has ever experienced. He goes on to say, for then there will be a great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and will never be equaled again. If those days have, been, have not been cut short, no one would survive. That's how terrible those days would be. That's how distressing those days would be. So Jesus is saying, listen, once he desecrates, you know there is a danger now. The danger is, uh, is already uh, upon you. You just have to keep running, keep hiding. Keep, you know, keep away from Antichrist. Um, because he's not going to just keep quiet. He may come up as a man of peace, but he's the one who's going to bring conflict in this world. Um, and then, at that time, you just cannot survive. You just have to hide, your, you know, hide in places, um, places so that you may not be uh, caught by him. There will be... Uh, the damage that, uh, that is done in, on this earth for over centuries, ages together through earthquakes, through volcanoes, through hurricanes, through tornadoes, through tidal waves, through snowstorms, sandstorms, droughts and epidemics and uh, all the genocide from, uh, from, from, uh, you know, from, uh, from all the ages, from the beginning of the time until the present. All of it together will not even be anywhere closer to the kind of suffering Antichrist would bring on the earth, on the people who are left behind. How terrible those days would be, Jesus says, you better run. If those days are not shortened, no one will survive. So you may be looking at the world right now and thinking this is a terrible, these are terrible days. I want to tell you, Good news is these are not terrible days. Terrible days are going to come in front. They are yet to come and those days none of us would survive. The worst is yet to come. We'd love to say best is yet to come, but the worst is yet to come onto this world. All this is because of the rise of a person called Antichrist. 
So it's important for us to have a cl little bit of clarity on him as how a Bible reveals about him. Antichrist is a person who's against Christ. That's why he is Antichrist. He, he come, comes into this world as a leader. He will overtly oppose Christ and at the same time pass himself off as Christ. The Antichrist is a man who will appear on the world scene in the last days before the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Described both in Old Testament and, and the New Testament. He, he is not a figure who is introduced only in the New Testament. He is introduced already in the Old Testament. Described both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He will be the very incarnation of evil. Cleverly disguised as a dynamic and charismatic and a visionary leader. He will astound the world with his solutions to human problems that we are all facing right now. In fact, he would be the one who would bring peace in the Middle East. And the conflict that has been over centuries uh, has been happening in the Middle East would just be quietened down because of his leadership, under his leadership. In fact, he would become such a great leader, the, uh, his empire will span every continent and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will rise to the world domination by declaring himself as a man of peace. But in fact, he would be the one who would plunge the world into a global war. Even though Antichrist is identified by that name only four times in the Bible, he appears many more times in, in various, with various uh, uh, um, uh, uh, other names. He is also called the promise that shall come in Daniel chapter 9 verses 26. As a fierce king in Daniel chapter 8 verses 23. He is um, also described as a master of intrigue in Daniel chapter 8 verses 23 again. In Daniel chapter 11 verses 21, he is described as a despicable man. In Zechariah chapter 11 verses 16 and 17, he is uh, uh, called as a worthless shepherd. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3, he is called the one who brings destruction. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 8, he is called the lawless one. In chapter 2 verses 9 of 2 Thessalonians, he is called the evil man. In Revelation chapter 13, he is introduced as the beast that rises from the sea. So he's got multiple names by which Bible describes about about him. When he comes on scene, people will flock around him like, uh, like, 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 like fleas around the honey. Uh, they will revere him. They will do anything what he says. Anything that he asks. Eventually, his true character would come out. The Antichrist would aggressively live up to his horrible name, you know. He will persecute, torture, and kill all the people of God who are left behind, those who are choosing to follow Christ. All, and he leads armies of the world against um, uh, Israel into the battle of Armageddon. He'll be the most powerful dictator the world has ever seen, making um, Caesar or Hitler or Mao or Saddam seem um, tame by comparison. Many people wonder how the Antichrist could come to the world, worldwide power in those last days. Like, how would anyone follow such a person, right? Perhaps we have this mental image of him, uh, uh, you know, uh, as some kind of crazed, wild-eyed, unkempt uh, uh, lunatic from some kind of horror movie, you know, uh, or at least Hitler's face, whichever with a machine gun in his hand and one hand on, on an, uh, and an axe in the other hand and he probably would look really terrorizing but really that will be very far from different. That image is very far uh, from what he's actually going to look like. He may, he, may, he, may be, he may appear as the very leader the world is right now looking for. I'm sure he'll be well educated, very urbane, very witty, very warm, very ch ch uh, charming and 
very charismatic. In fact, the way he speaks, you would feel that he has your best interests in his heart. You would be deceived into welcoming him into your lives and your families. In, 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 he performs miracles and uh, 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 signs and wonders in such a way that you would actually believe he may really be God and you would begin to worship him. He would have this extraordinary abilities in every sense of the word. So here's my personal theory on how he would look like. He'll have the good looks of John F. Kennedy, the folkishness of Ronald Reagan. I didn't say this, by the way. <laughs> Ray Pitcher wrote this, so I'm just reading it from him. Folkishness of Ronald Reagan and, uh, Reagan and uh, uh, inspirational power of Winston Churchill, leadership of Franklin D. Roosevelt, vision of Abraham Lincoln, military prowess of Douglas MacArthur, uh, responsibility of Gandhi and charm of Will Rogers, genius of Albert Einstein. Who would not love a guy like this? Right? That's how Antichrist would look like when he comes into the power. All these attributes will be wrapped up in him. Uh, it will make an irresistible human personality. And to top it off, he will be wholly and totally energized by Satan. He is the ultimate angel of light. Masquerading for a time as a benevolent leader, but soon uh, the truth would come out. He will, uh, he'll be, up, as he will, he's opposed to Christ, he will offer himself to the world as the savior of the world. He will control the global economy and force his followers to receive that mark on their hand and their foreheads or their foreheads. Most of the world will willingly follow him. To use uh, the biblical phrase, they will believe that lie only to be condemned at the end. Those who do, do not receive that mark will be hunted down and many will be killed. scary. For a short time, he will become the most powerful man on earth. At the apex of his power, he will launch uh, an all-out attack on Jews. Before he launches an all-out all attack on Jews, he would be the one who would bring the peace in the Middle East. He would be the one who would come up, uh, declare himself as the savior of Jews. In fact, all the Jews would begin to believe him and revere him as the one that God sent, uh, sent to this earth in order for, for them to have the peace on earth, uh, he would be the one who would make sure Jews would be able to build a temple uh, in the place that it, you know, the thing that is there right now. In that place, they would actually rebuild the temple and begin the worship. He would allow them to begin to worship there. Bible talks about how in the middle of the tribulation, at three and a half years later of the tribulation, of the seven years of tribulation, he would then come, walk into the city of Jerusalem, walk into the temple, destroy everything that is there and erect a statue and demand that Jews would worship him as their God. And when Jews refused at that time, refused at, the, at that time, he would then declare um, a war against them in a place called Megiddo in the Valley of Jezreel. That's in the central region of Israel. Look at the detailing Bible gives us, by the way. I mean, I'm very, I mean, I, I, I've studied before, not really as, as I'm studying for, for this series right now, but as I'm looking at this detailing that Bible actually shows to us, I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated at how we can ignore following Christ. How we can, you know, not take God seriously. How we cannot take the worship of Jesus seriously when so many details are given to us so clearly. His reign of terror will come all of a sudden. And when he... But then he, he you know, his, his reign itself will come to an end all of a sudden when Jesus then, at the end of the, uh, the second half of this tribulation, comes down along with his church to this earth and 
Paul describes that so beautifully in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8, when he says, by the breath of his word, he will destroy the Antichrist. Now, if we read or think about Antichrist, it may put fear in our hearts. But the truth is this. This is what Jesus is trying to show us. He's trying to tell us, don't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of the Antichrist. We shouldn't be afraid of this evil ruler. First of all, you are not going to be here. You will be taken up. But just in case, even if you are left behind, because of your unfaithfulness, you should not be afraid of him. I'm, I'm hoping none of us would be left behind. I'm just saying, just in case, you shouldn't be afraid of him. Why? Because Jesus will be the victor at the end. That if with one breath he would destroy the Antichrist. The question would be, obviously, will, he, will this Antichrist, is he already present? I, have, I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate right now. Um, if Christ is coming in this generation, I might, uh, I might want to say, yeah, he is. Maybe it's somewhere, it's definitely not in India, but growing somewhere at this point of time. If Christ tarries, maybe he will be revealed later on. But I, right now, I am not sitting here talking about dates and uh, names and stuff like that. So don't, don't expect me to do that from this pulpit. That's not what I'm, my intention is. Neither uh, my goal is to do that. My, just, my goal is just to show you what Bible is talking about and then warn you about the second coming. But what I think the scripture is trying to point out to us is that now we know the Lord, we know what he told us, we better be prepared for his coming. If we read or think about him, it, we, and then give in to fear, then we have missed the whole point, the great point, that Jesus is the victor in the end. So we must live with that hope, because our God is a God of hope. And in Christ, we have a great hope for the future. That if he can bring such evil to an end, he can bring an end to the suffering that you are experiencing today in your home, in your family, in your body, in your workplace. That the suffering and the evil that you are experiencing today in your personal life is nothing compared to that. And that evil itself can be controlled by the power of the word of God. It can be. Anything in your life right now can be controlled. Jesus is still the hope for your life, for your body, for your family, for your financial situation. That is my point today. We need to remember that. If we can understand that, and that's, I think that's what Jesus was trying to point out to us, saying don't give up on anything that's going in your, in your life right now. Because I'm going to take care of the end. Uh, if I'm going to take care of the end, the, 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 the worst that is going to come I can take care of the worst that, that you're going through right now. There is still hope for your life, for your marriage, for your financial situation, for your children. There is still hope for your tomorrow. You see, even Antichrist is an instrument in God's hand. That he can do nothing without God's permission. When his time is up on the earth, he will be utterly destroyed. So even if, even Antichrist would be, would be able to do anything against you, only if God gives permission. Which means even what, even those days that may seem like out of control are still in the control of God's hand. You are today in the control of God's hand. Your family today is in the control of God's hand. So don't give up on what God can do in your life today. Now that we know who he is, it's important for us to know how he operates in this world today. You see, if Antichrist is going to be revealed after the rapture of the church, then why should we be worried about him, right? That's the question. Some of, some of you want to ask are not asking me right now, but that's the question. If he's going to come after I'm, getting, I'm going to heaven, why should I be worried? Uh, you should be worried. 
because I think that's what Jesus was trying to point out to us. The, the thing about Antichrist is that even before he reveals himself, he's already at work here on earth. We call it the spirit of Antichrist. At that time, if anyone says to you, look here, here is the Christ. There he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great miracles and signs and wonders to deceive. That's the point. The way he operates in this world is through deception. Paul, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7, talks about how this lawless man would be revealed at the time of Christ. At the time when the uh, you know, restriction is taken away from this earth, where the church is taken up, the Holy Spirit is taken up along with us, and the world is without the Holy Spirit. And that's when the lawless man can come out and uh, reveal himself. Because the restriction that is right now, Holy Spirit, the reason why Antichrist is not being revealed today is because the Holy Spirit is actually stopping him. So that you and I can be saved and go to heaven. See the grace of God in our lives. Eh? The moment the Holy Spirit is taken away, the restrictive hand of God is taken away, the lawless man would be revealed. When would the Holy Spirit be taken away from this face of this earth? When the church is taken up. That's why I'm saying we will go before the guy reveals himself. And uh, along with us, the Holy Spirit, you know, obviously leaves the earth. And then the world is without anybody to convict them of their sin. And that's when the lawless man can reveal himself. But prior to that, Paul talks about how the secret power of the lawlessness is already at work. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, he's saying that. For the secret power of the lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. You remember just now I told you about Holy Spirit being taken out. In 1 John chapter 2, John talks about Antichrist again. Dear children, chapter 2 verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. He's talking about end days. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. In fact, even now, many antichrists have come. He's talking about the first century. Huh? He's writing this letter in the first century and he's saying, we know antichrist is going to come, the real one is going to come, but there are more antichrists right now in, prevalent in this world uh, under, the, uh, you know, uh, under the disguise of messiahs and Christ and Christians and uh, prophets and pastors and uh, all that. In fact, because of the presence of all these false prophets and false Christs, we now know we are in the last hour, Paul says, um, John says. As I began to read John, uh, uh, what John is trying to teach us and what other places in the scripture begin to uh, teach us regarding the Antichrist, uh, how he operates in this world, I realized the deception of the Antichrist is threefold. Number one, the deception of Antichrist causes spiritual blindness. Causes spiritual blindness. World in general gets blinded to the truth. In order for you to believe in a lie, truth has to be hidden from you. If you are blind to truth, then you will believe anything that comes across your way as the truth. Right? So what Antichrist, how he operates in this world is that he would uh, uh, begin to present what is wrong and prohibited as right and acceptable. Think about that. What's happening around the world right now? That if I, if anybody right now, at least in, in India, I still have the freedom to say whatever I want from the pulpit. You go to any Western con country, try there standing up on the pulpit and try and talk about the issues of LGBTQ. Talk boldly about what Bible says and call it wrong as wrong, you are dead. I mean, not literally, but your ministry is dead. Nobody's going to follow you after that. 
because what is wrong and prohibited directly in the scripture has now become right and acceptable the whole society is now you know if you watch netflix anything in netflix or anything in amazon or anything that you see in ott right now even in indian web series is you would begin to see these issues creep in so quietly that all our children who are watching that are now being uh, 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 you know taught that it's okay it's normal it's a normal thing to do it's a normal thing to think it's it's you don't have to do it but if somebody else is doing it you don't have to worry about it you see the point right now that's how deception works what is right is uh, what is right is presented as wrong what is wrong is presented as right what is prohibited in the scripture is presented as something that is acceptable something that's okay so by making what is wrong and prohibited right and acceptable by promoting what is falsehood as authentic antichrist works in this world look at john chapter 4 for 1 john chapter 4 Uh, on how he um, describes these days 1 john chapter 4 um, verses 1 to 6 dear friends do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the spirit i know he's talking to the church okay and i'll come to that point also do not believe everyone who claims to speak in the, by the spirit you must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from god or not so i can stand on this pulpit and say I, I, I have the spirit of God, but I may not really have. For there are many false prophets in this world. This is how you, we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in real body, that person has the spirit of God. but if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus that person is not from god such a person has the spirit of antichrist which you heard is coming into this world and indeed is already here and he goes on to say but you belong to god my dear children you have already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world those people belong to the world so they speak of speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them but we belong to god and those who know god listens to us if they do not belong to god they do not listen to us this is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception i know he's talking to the church but he's also talking about how the uh, you know the whole deception operates in this world the 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 problem would be this then that the church would begin to move towards developing itching ears because it sounds so good so pleasing to people and they'd be like okay uh, so i don't really have to be very different from the world i can be just like them and still be a christian still follow uh, 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 you know some of the things of christ uh, uh, while i am not getting opposed uh, around the world so some if if i stand in this pulpit and i give you permission to do what the world is doing you'd be happy to keep coming back to this church i mean i hope none of you would come back if i do that ever okay i do hope that you would just walk away from this church if ever i do that but in general people would love to come to churches places where their ears are being scratched whatever they want to hear is being taught in second peter chapter 2 uh, i'm i'm going to make you read a lot of scriptures today okay because i want to tell you what i'm te- make sure that you understand what i'm telling you is the truth okay second peter chapter 2 uh, peter talks about the same kind of spirit he says but there there, there there but there are also there were also false prophets in israel just as there are there will be false prophets false teachers among you they will cleverly teach destructive heresies 
and even deny the master who brought them who bought them in this way they will bring sudden destruction on themselves many will follow this evil teaching me is talking about church uh, by the way he's talking about church people many will follow this evil teaching and shameful immortality immorality sorry and because of these teachers the way of truth will be slandered in their greed they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money but god condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed i can go on reading he, he even gets a little more serious after that so let me just pause there you understand what i'm trying to say that if if somebody stands up in the church and teaches whatever you want you would keep going back to that person in fact you would like those fabricated lies and stories and you would listen to it because they are very pleasing to you itching ears in second timothy chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 he talks about that itching ears in the latter days paul says to timothy people will develop itching ears so they will look for a preacher who will stand behind them and scratch their ears and they'll feel like so right i have a pug i know i would be yes so last days of this age will be marked by enormous spiritual deception we will see an outbreak of false religion far beyond anything that has ever be, ever happened before there will be this convergence of new age uh, deception ancient paganism liberalism humanism s- satanism uh, relativism and hedonism i'll talk about hedonism a little later aided by the promotion of homosexuality abortion mm, terrorism and denial of the bible as the word of god and the denial of jesus as the only way of salvation no wonder tim lahaye uh, said that he, 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 we may well be the last generation before jesus comes it's easy and becoming easier to follow the wrong voices these days in our confusion in our anger against somebody who has wronged you we are eager to follow someone else who is teaching you falsehood i'm hoping i make sense to you today in times like these paul calls timothy to teach word of god as it is the same paul when he talks about the teaching years one one verse later he says you timothy preach the word sound doctrine present sound doctrine to people whether they will accept or not is not your responsibility your job is to present truth as it is the second way the deception of antichrist works the spirit of antichrist works is by promoting selfishness by promoting selfishness it's a hedonistic mindset it's a mindset that says i will do everything for my pleasure increasingly the world is moving towards a mindset like that i don't care about what you think about what i do i do what i do because i enjoy what i do i like what i do it may be wrong in your sight but i like what i do and i think it is right you can never tell me i am doing wrong that makes sense right now i hope i made my statement properly if you honestly put your hand on your heart and you you realize what i've just told you is truth the people increasingly would do what they want don't care about others the harm that causes others we don't think about that anymore our pleasure should never jeopardize the sacred right of somebody else ravi once a uh, speaking on pleasure he says this our pleasure should never jeopardize the sacred right of somebody else the moment it jeopardizes somebody else's sacred right you are doing wrong however good it may look like the world has increasingly become hedonistic in its mindset jesus talked about it in luke chapter 17 same context He says the last days will be the day, uh, like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah like, like the days of Lot like the days of Noah when people are giving into drinking and debauchery and 
they would do whatever they want they don't care about what anybody is thinking they don't care about what god is thinking they don't care about even their own family they would do whatever they want they'd say this is my right i'm making money i can do whatever i want people would keep living like that and those are the signs that you must look out for and realize the time is coming the days of noah in one scripture in john uh, in matthew chapter 24 same passage repeated in john uh, luke chapter 17 he calls it days of lot days of noah and days of lot these days would be like that when people have this mindset that pleasure over everything am i enjoying my life or not that would be their priority and it doesn't matter what uh, what others rights are it doesn't matter what happens to others uh they would be there because of that there would be a diminishing respect for what is sacred diminishing respect for the holiness of god diminishing respect for the truth of god diminishing respect for the saints of god the, the you know in, paul talks about in second timothy chapter 3 sometimes just making statements won't make mm, would not be good enough so better read the scripture itself chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 you should know this timothy that in the last day second timothy chapter 3 verses 1 in the last days there will be very difficult times why would they become difficult because people will love only themselves and their money they will be boastful and proud scoffing at god you see the diminishing respect towards the sacred that's what I'm, that's what i mean they'd be scoffing at god thinking god is a big idea disobedient to their parents respect diminishing respect the authority disobedient to their parents and ungrateful i i, I wonder why they put those two together i mean paul puts two, two, those two together basically he's trying to say children would become so selfish in their mindset that they would demand parents to do what they want then say it's your responsibility you better do children will talk to parents like that so don't be horrified if your child is talking like that this is how the world the world would look like in the last days so we the only thing we can do is to teach them the word put word in their hearts from now itself so that they will not turn out to be like that that they would become ungrateful for what parents have done the sacrifices parents have made in order to make sure their children have a better future let's go on reading i'm i'm hoping none of you are behaving like that with your parents okay just just uh, they will consider nothing sacred they will become they will be unloving and unforgiving they will slander others and have no self control absolutely no self control they will be cruel and hate what is good they will betray their friends and be reckless and be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than god they will act religious but they will reject the power that can make them godly so there you go i i am not saying all this bible is saying all this that we would become like this that we would have this hedonistic mindset that we would have diminishing respect for sacred i'll come to the authority a little later um in the next point too again but basically my point is the church would also be caught up in this kind of mindset that the church would become focused on experience rather than the truth how good do i feel when i go to church is the song according to how i want it to be is the sound according to how i want to be is the ambience good for me to sit down and and and, and enjoy uh did i have a good feeling when i went away from the church if not this let me go to another place where there are other group of people where i can feel comfortable experience stuff if that's your mindset you are in a really, really bad state right now 
bad predicament. Church will become experience-based rather than truth. Timothy says that, just in the next few verses. Looks at, look at what he says, verse 6. They are the kind of people who would, who would work in their, their ways into people's homes and win confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following the new teachings, but they are never able to understand, never be able to understand the truth. I know he's talking about women there. I mean, specific group of people. But I kind of realized that that is the picture of the church today. That's why false prophets can come into the church and stand up on the pulpits and say whatever they want to and you and me like, a, like these gullible women would follow them. Would listen to whatever they say because it's so good to listen to. We are burdened by our sin, so therefore somebody who comes and says, it's okay, you are forgiven in Jesus. From now onwards, whatever you do is not sin, not considered as a sin. You're saying, wow, that's good. You want to get away with that guilt of sin, right? No wonder hyper grace has become such a big thing across the globe. Or if someone walks into your home and you know, on the, onto the pulpit and, and uh, um, uh, you know, talks about your desires and how God will fulfill your desires, you'd be compelled by those te te teachings. And no wonder prosperity gospel is so big across the globe. Church seeks for experience rather than truth. Um, I, and um, number three, uh, the, the deception of um, uh, um, the Antichrist works, the spirit of Antichrist advocates lawlessness. Advocates lawlessness. It fosters rebellious nature. It fosters rebellious nature. Why should I become the mantra of the new age? Why should I? Why should I do it? Why should I believe it? How do I know what you're telling is truth? No, it's important for us to, you know, question things that, that we are receiving. But the attitude, I'm talking about the attitude that the scripture is describing as a, as a mindset that you don't... You, actually, we are like this from the beginning. In fact, it is because of the rebellious nature, sin has entered into this world. In verses 8, chapter 3, verses 8, again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. These teachers who oppose the truth, just as uh, Yanis and Ambris opposed Moses, they have depraved minds and counterfeit faith. Um, so yeah, uh, th these two guys rebelled against Moses, basically. When Moses is talking about what God wants them to do, these two guys rebelled against Moses and said, listen, how do we know what you're telling is true? You see the mindset? You see the attitude? That's the kind of attitude now is prevalent even within the church. Outside, it's already there anyway, but it's already entered into the church. There is this hatred for boundaries. Uh, there is Freedom without boundaries is lawlessness. Remember that. This country gives us the freedom to do whatever we want. Speak boldly, speak freely, practice our religion, our faith freely. But this country also has boundaries, which we cannot cross. The law has boundaries, which you cannot cross. The moment you break that, you would become lawless. In verses 13 of chapter 3 again, he says, uh, uh, listen, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and they themselves will be deceived. The way they become rebellious, this is how they will do. They will deceive everybody along with themselves getting deceived. They will lead people into deception and they will flourish. 
And that obviously leads to lack of respect for authority, especially spiritual authority. Second Peter chapter 2. Verses 10 to 13. It's okay if you don't like what I'm preaching today and not come back to the church, okay? <laughs> but just let's get this. Verses, verses 10. Chapter 2, verses 10. He's especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and do despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. You see the picture of what members inside the church would be? That's what he's saying. This is how church members would become some of the church members. Not Capstonians, but I'm just saying. Some of the church members. They would scoff at anything God. Scoff at supernatural things. They would make fun of it. They would despise the spiritual authority. <coughs> Let's continue. Here. But, but, but the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare even to, to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against the, the, those supernatural. Even the angels who have fallen away cannot talk against the supernatural beings in the presence of God. What he's saying is, even the fallen angels don't dare to talk back to God. But the people inside the church would talk back to God. Verses 12. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things that they do not understand. Like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. You see, the thing is simple. Because of the rebelliousness and because of the lack of authority, there is this individualistic mindset that develops within the church. Uh, I don't care about anybody. I, don't, I, I am good enough. That mindset would come in into the church. Well, Antichrist is the final example of that, but the spirit is already working at in the world. So let me just pause there and close as I give you three suggestions today. Go back and read John chapter 2. Okay, what I'm sharing is from John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Three practical applications that John gives us. First, be firm. Talking about the Antichrist and false prophets, in the context of that, the spirit of Antichrist, he first gives us a call to be firm. Firm in what? In the truth, which comes through the word of God. This is very clear, huh? The truth that comes from the word of God, not from others, but the word of God. Be firm in the truth. That's why Paul encourages Timothy, please teach the truth. Teach the sound doctrine to people. Rebuke them. Correct them. Nudge them in the right direction. Train them so that they can read the word and be firm in the word of God. Be firm in the truth through the word of God. Number two, be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again and again, twice, Paul, uh, um, uh, uh, John reminds us in that letter, reminds the church and us that it is by the Holy Spirit you will know the truth and you will stand firm. The Spirit of God will help you to distinguish between what comes from God and what comes from the devil. He will give you the discernment. He would empower you to know what is right and what is wrong. And number three, um, be pure. Be pure as you continue to live righteously in the sight of God. What, in other words, he's trying to tell us. I gave you cross-references too, by the way, just in case you guys want to uh, go back home and study on that. Um, I have a guest today who, you know, so that's why I'm closing it very quickly. Um, be pure as you follow what God teaches, uh, what God demands from you what God expects from you. As you keep doing that, you'd be blameless on the day of the Lord. 
that's a challenge that the scripture gives us. Be firm in the truth that comes from the word of God, not from other people. There is no other revelation apart from this. Huh? Remember this. Don't ever believe anybody who says, God gave me a special revelation. God finished with the special revelation already. Okay. This is, this, this is what God wanted to tell us. He already told us. Be firm in the truth that comes from the word of God. Be filled by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And be pure as you continue in righteousness, which is of God. I mean, do the will of God. That's what it means. And as you do that, in the end, you would stand firm. Whether uh, you are taking the first lift or the second lift, whichever lift, elevator, and it's okay, whichever elevator you want to take, you take. If those of you who don't understand that reference, don't worry about that, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's important that we know how Antichrist works in this world so that we can be careful and be on our guard. Is that okay? May God help us to do that. Let's close our eyes. I, I would love to give you a moment to think about um, what you've heard today and just one minute reflect on what you've heard, received. But, but I want you to continue to reflect as you go back to your home. Take this seriously and reflect on this again and again. If you're on um, our WhatsApp groups, we will, I'll share the notes with you guys so you can study on that. Is that okay? I think it's important that you guys reflect on this. But I just want to pray with you today. Pray that we will be a church that is firmly rooted in the word of God. That we would be a church that is empowered by the Spirit of God. That we would be a church that is not seeking after experiences or compromising on the Word of God, but we would be a church that respects what comes from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That we would be a church that is together. Father, I want to thank you, God, for this morning. Your presence here in this place is very clear. And we pray that God, that as we begin to allow this word of God to sink into our hearts, would you just continue to minister to us, God. Throughout this week, keep reminding us of the truth we have received. And I pray that we would not take this lightly reflect on this study so that we would not be caught up by the deception of the spirit of antichrist but that we would be empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit as he illuminates the word of God to us help us to be deeply rooted in the word of God and stand firm until the end for you're looking for people who would stand firm in the truth. We would like to be that church, God. Holy Spirit, would you help us? Bless you. Pray for everyone who is praying that prayer. I pray that their, our hearts would be challenged to, to pursue you, pursue the truth, pursue the Spirit of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I, I got five minutes more. Um, we have a guest today with us uh, from um, every year. We, on, on one particular Sunday, we, we have a representative from Gideon's International to come and talk about how uh, their work has been a, been a tool in transforming many lives uh, across the globe. And uh, Gideon's International, if some of you, if you're familiar uh, with their ministry, you know how important their work is. Um, across the globe and um, it is always our joy for us to contribute into the work that they do and so we have a representative from there to come uh, my brother would you like to come on stage and um